John Oceans, and welcome to Schooling Around. Updating Oxford High's Tech Ed on the web, underwater, on the ground, and all around. The BPA goes to nationals, and Lakeville Elementary cooks up some Spanish with a little ASL on top. Stay tuned. As career ed training goes, tech ed is a big deal these days. Hardly anything runs without some kind of computerization, and keeping up with the latest classes is like keeping up with the latest iPhone. We checked in with Oxford High's CTE coordinator, Lisa Butts, who updates our memory chip. Okay, well currently in Career and Tech Ed here at Oxford High School we have seven state approved programs and we're looking in the future to um, add a few more programs and kind of strengthen and broaden what we uh, the Career and Tech Ed programs that we have here at the high school. Currently we have broadcast news, engineering, programming, IT, marketing, auto and finance and we are currently going through the state approved process um, to have our mechatronics program state approved. Uh, we will be one of uh, very few high schools in Oakland County to have a in-school mechatronics program. Just what is that? So mechatronics is um, somewhat of a branch of engineering. So we do have a general engineering program, but mechatronics is more of the robotic side of it. No. Currently, the state is funding our programs based off of a hot jobs list, if you will, or um, hot jobs for the future list. And mechatronics is actually higher than general engineering on the latest hot jobs list. So we were already running that program, had already spent money um, having everything that we need in order to successfully run a mechatronics program. We just hadn't gone through the state approval process and so we're currently doing that right now. One of the requirements for our CTE programs is that we must be we must have a CTSO, a career um, technical student organization, that the students are able to take what they learn in the classroom and then compete out in um, you can compete out in the industry and you can compete out with other high schools at the local, state, and national, or in sometimes uh, robotics calls it the world level, if sure. you will. Um, so within all of those seven programs that uh, we just discussed, each of those programs um, either has its own CTSO or falls under the umbrella of a CTSO. So for example, our marketing program um, has DECA. So I'm sure you've heard about the DECA program, so that we have a lot of success with that program as well. We also have business professionals of America. The difference with Business Professionals of America is that kind of, it, it takes um, more of our programs under its umbrella, if you will. So uh, programming and IT and broadcast news. So those students are all involved in Business Professionals of America. And we have our auto club for our, our, our auto tech program. And then we also uh, now with the mechatronics coming on board to be a state approved program, then of course we would have the robotics program, which also takes some of our gen our general engineering students as well. Now you have HOSA too. Does that fall under that category? So HOSA, we're working on it. You know, HOSA is one of those future programs that we would like to have state approved. Updated teacher requirements is an important issue. And I asked if a business alliance might be in store. The difference between um, career and tech ed programs in a high school setting is that the teachers have real world experience. We have a vocational certification. So in addition to a teacher certification, as do most teachers K-12, career and tech ed teachers have a vocational certification. That certification shows that we have at least 4,000 hours out in the industry, out in the career field. Okay, so you'll find in, in high schools or in the area, in the state even, that there's a struggle to pull some of those professionals out of the industry and get them in the classroom. Also, uh, a little bit of problem that we're running into is finding um, teachers that could potentially already be teaching and we'd like to turn them into a career in tech ed teacher. 
but there, the 4,000 hours has to be recent and relevant. So within five to six years, you would have had to have had that experience. And if it exceeds that time, they no longer allow you to use those hours. So the options would be teach at the post-secondary level, get an additional job, you know, find ways to make those hours recent and relevant. So the hope is that the state would loosen that a bit so that we can have more uh, teachers become certified because right now there's a shortage in a lot of areas yes. and we've talked about what are some creative ways that we can get this experience for our teachers we want the best of the best in the classroom to be able to prepare our kids for those jobs right when they leave high school not everyone is college ready so we would like them to be prepared to go directly into the workforce so how can we best do that the answer is to work with those who are already doing it, get the experience, have the, our teachers get the experience that they need in order to teach our students to be ready. So we've had that discussion, but it all falls back on the state requirements, what the state is allowing to happen, and those are all in the works as well. One of our classes is clearly all wet. More in a moment. Canine Stray Rescue is Oxford's own local dog rescue. Call them at 248-628-0435 or go to their website, dogsaver.org, and click on the Canine Stray Rescue League link. If you're talking career technical ed, sooner or later robotics comes into play. Some of it is really underwater. Teacher Phil Kimmel is in charge of that. This is our underwater robotics class. What these students are working on right now is every couple of weeks we get a new design challenge. And this particular design challenge has the students picking up ping pong balls on the top of the surface of the pool. And then they have to take them down underneath the water about five or six feet and then uh, release the ping pong balls into a submerged uh, Rubbermaid tub that would be hanging upside down underneath the water. So they're figuring out right now where do they want to place their motors for the, for the best uh, uh, drive capabilities. They're figuring out what type of netting they might want to use for a uh, collection of ping pong balls and just kind of overall analyzing what's what's going to happen as they drive through this uh, challenge. No, this is actually uh, a class that we've had for a long time and in the future now what's, what's going to be happening, uh, we will be uh, turning this class into a class called Mechatronics. And Mechatronics is a study of uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer-aided uh, design, uh, computer programming, and we're going to kind of all roll it all into one um, one class. So we're going to um, be, we're, we'll, we'll still be doing the underwater robotics as part of Mechatronics, uh, but it won't be a standalone class anymore. So it'll kind of, the students will get more um, mechanical engineering and design. We, and we've had engineering classes that, that provide that opportunity before, but not on this same level. Mechatronics is going to be a, uh, a state-recognized program that will allow for some, uh, some uh, work with colleges, uh, right, where we, where we can take those credits uh, and maybe pass those on along to, uh, if we have successful completers for the program, they can uh, take those credits and, and move on to uh, a community college or whatnot. And it's also something that we, we've been focusing on engineering in the past, but this allows us an opportunity for A, a little bit more funding, and B, um, some specialized classes. The state recognizes right now that mechatronics is a growing area, a uh, career uh, area, and so they really want to put a focus on, on that. Coming up for air, we find teacher Maria Wolbert in charge of web design too. Well, Web Design 2 is the second portion, second course that they can take at Oxford High School. It is a semester class, and basically the students get way beyond just the general idea of design. They get into the actual CSS coding and HTML coding of a site. So they were just learning how to make it responsive, where it's compatible for mobile and then tablet and desktop view. And in fact, uh, so these two gentlemen are working on a site for a lady who, it's actually Jimmy's it's mother, mom. okay? It's for a legitimate business, it's for a boot camp business. So they are creating a site for the boot camp. It's called Harvey's Boot Camp. And they met with the client, she came in, determined exactly what needed to be into the site, uh, did layouts, did a whole six step process. Now they're in the process of finalizing the home page. So 
So maybe the gentleman can show you what they're doing and a little bit more about the site. One of the design teams is Jimmy Harvey and Eric Armbruster. Oh, my mom is a fitness instructor, so she needed like, like stuff about her classes. She needed a schedule. She needed uh, like references and then the like location. So we're making a site first so that people can go on the website and find all this information out. So these are the classes that she offers. And then we have, how does it start? We have a little bit of background information on the home page. And then we have, what are we about? And then we have a bunch of pictures on here. And then you'll be going to different links. Like yeah. in the other pages that aren't developed yet will mm -hmm. be like the schedule for the week, mm -hmm. the instructors. There'll be a calendar. Mm -hmm. Testimonials, and of course the location. So this is just the home page thus far. And we can see how they've gotten. They're just designing it. And she really likes her purples. We're not <laughs> done yet. They're not done yet, but no. they're ju they just started it based on what her needs and desires were for the home page. And of course, she signed a very healthy contract with you guys, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So you, when you're done with this, you, will you guys be able to go out into the real world and design websites for people who need them? or? Uh, hopefully, because I want to go to college and study web design too. So So you're kind of getting a foot ahead in the yeah. in things, aren't you? Yeah. And you're getting college and high school credit along the way mm -hmm. too. I wonder if there's an opportunity for all early college credits for something like this, is that? It is incorporated. Actually, with the web design, we are articulated, for example, with OCC and some other colleges. Working on another site is Autumn Coaster and Tyler Essenmacher. My parents have a dog breeding business, and they only had a Facebook page, so they got to Facebook users, but they decided they wanted to branch out and reach out to more people to see their website so we decided that we would take on making a website for them. So we met with my mom and asked her what she wanted to do with it and we've just been putting it together for her and hopefully it'll be done and ready to put up soon. Very good. Now I'm a real amateur at this sort of thing but <laughs> there's more to websites than just designing them and coming up with a good one. There's something about putting it on the web in such a way that they come up frequently based upon how people do their searches and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Is that part of all this? Yeah, eventually, after we finish designing the website. Okay, so that's part of the class too, huh? Right. Um, what you're referring to, they call search engine optimization. And so basically, this, that will be the next step, is after the students totally validate all the code, make sure it's cross-browser compatible, so it can open in Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, and any other browser that it's compatible with. Once they ensure all of that, then we will be ready to FTP to load it onto a legitimate website that the clients own. And then at that point, that's when the students would learn about search engine op optimization of how to get it up higher without having to pay. Lots of competitions going on, including one coming up for the BPA. Stay tuned. Chaz Millard is the teacher in charge of the BPA, otherwise known as the Business Professionals of America. His specialty is broadcast arts. Yeah, you get your high school grades and everything like that. Uh, we're also working on articulation agreements as well, so students will have the ability to earn college credits. So it'll take off like maybe six introduction credits from classes they would normally take if this is a field that they pursue in the future. Other things we want to look at as well is uh, career expectations and career profiling. So what kind of career path, what do they have to do in order to get to be a director, to get to be a news anchor, to get to be a camera operator, what's the career path and what steps do they have to take and things that they're really working on as well. So the goal is to divide the class up into multiple years and hit on all these different things in the proper depth and scope so that the students have the most information possible. Now has state aid gotten any better for your area as far as broadcast is concerned over the last couple of years? 
we've done pretty well for ourselves, actually. Yeah, we've been very fortunate to have a lot of help uh, from everyone and from the county and from the state. Uh, seeing it as a, a field that is something that is viable and that, again, it's another option for students as well. The more options we have, uh, the better off things can be long run. So we've been very fortunate with the equipment and everything that we've been able to get. The BPA has a big event coming up. Uh, we recently had our state competitions where we had a student qualify for nationals. Uh, so he'll be leaving in the first week of May, near the end of the, like May 5th, May 6th. He'll be leaving and competing uh, in Boston for a chance uh, placement there. And then we also have uh, some other things going on as well. We have a fundraiser coming up, uh, multiple fundraisers, and we're participating with the Oxford Gives Back as well. Uh, to give the students a chance of community and field, uh, we're trying to really grow that group and make it something that's a year-round group organization, not just a competitive organization. Stephen Reynolds is one of our kids going to nationals. So Stephen Reynolds is a senior and he competes in uh, what's called open events. So it's like uh, time tests that the students have to take and he does a lot of computer programming and things of that nature. Okay, and just so the folks out there understand, BPA covers a lot of different fields, doesn't it? Can, can you give us, just rattle off a few of them for us? Yeah, Business Professionals America, what it does is it covers a lot of different professional fields in business, uh, giving students an opportunity to work on their presentation skills, teamwork, collaboration, uh, and just in the fields that they enjoy from accounting to presentation management, uh, to video production, computer production and animation, and so on. So a lot of different avenues for students to uh, really expand their skills. Next, some hands-on Spanish with Senora Cervantes at Lakeville. A couple of years ago, Lakeville Elementary was in need of a Spanish teacher. What they found was a real treasure. Her name is Carmen Cervantes. She teaches Spanish to kindergarten through third grade. Her life has been filled with unique experiences, including teaching English to Chinese seniors while her husband was working there. I was in my 40s learning Mandarin for the first time, and so the shoe was on the other foot. Um, at some point you think you understand what it's like to be a student and what their needs are but until you are truly a foreigner in another land where you don't know any words you've never heard the conversations the pronunciation the language opens up your eyes in a whole, do, do, uh, whole new way uh, the experience was very enlightening and unique it was wonderful so that's where I got to teach adults for the first time and I taught them English and it was conversational mainly, but um, it was a wonderful experience. Came back to the U.S., um, continued teaching adults English, but now it was a mixed cultural group from all over, mainly refugees, and um, that was in Ohio, and then we moved to Michigan, and that was 2014. Um, still had moving boxes in the house, and uh, was a new empty nester and decided, well, there's a school around the corner. Um, this is a good time to go send in an application. The summer hiring is going to be happening and maybe I'll just get in there and get my feet wet and do something on the side that I'll enjoy doing. Um, one thing led to another and October 2014, I started teaching Spanish, um, kinder first in second grade, and that was last year. When was the first time you taught kids, <clears throat> elementary school kids, a foreign language? That would have been uh, when we lived in Buffalo, New York. So that would have been, um, in. for five years we lived in Buffalo. We left there in 2008. Right. So those five years prior to leaving Buffalo, I was teaching an after-school program. I was teaching Spanish to elementary school children. A mixed age, it was kinder through fifth grade, all inclusive. You've had experience teaching a language to adults. Yes. And you've had experience teaching a foreign language to kids. Yes. What is special about the methodology of teaching a foreign language to little children like this? Um, little children are very open-minded. Um, 
they're like sponges they're excited they have high energy um, and, and and if you make it fun and exciting and and if you're passionate about it they pick on up that immediately they um, they just follow through so to me it's like I I set the tone and my attitude makes a big difference so um, I think that's what's most exciting about teaching this age level also although I will say at any age teaching is fun when you're teaching a, a foreign language I enjoy teaching beginners because they come with a clean slate and pretty much an open mind and a lot of nerves um, and I just I like that challenge because I think knowing that they're nervous and uncomfortable and scared I've been in their shoes and so I can completely relate to that and if you notice that's why I um, have learned to incorporate um, a lot of body language which led to incorporating an actual ASL um, vocabulary or tool to help reinforce what I'm teaching in the classroom. Okay, so what's different about teaching little kids? Well, I think the difference is, unless you were in my shoes and we went to China and we never experienced the language, most adults have some background, history, or stereotypes about a language that have already been instilled in them. So it's really hard to say that you're starting from a clean slate. Little kids, a clean slate can mean a clean slate. Like, they've never heard it, they've never experienced it. They have no um, set um, stereotypes about it. It's, it's completely a, a whole new world. And so you're just taking this fresh mind and, and that's why I also feel my job is, um, it puts a little bit of the burden on me. I mean, I'm the ambassador for the Spanish language the Spanish-speaking cultures and heritage and countries. Um, and also I like to expand that and make them see it as this is how you need to face everything you learn new. So we have Spanish with a little American Sign Language thrown into the mix. How did that come about? Well, when we lived in Texas, prior to Buffalo, um, we encountered a family who was experiencing um, a child with deafness and they had never had that experience before and frankly we hadn't either. And so that rare experience seeing a family go through that situation from the initial beginnings of, of an infant um, carried through to our family. We were very close with them and we, um, we embrace cultures and languages from the get-go. That's how our family is. But this was a very different situation. It's another language, it's a foreign language, and it's another culture. And we just, but it's funny how we had never thought of it. You just had never experienced it in your own life. So here it was now front and center, a part of our everyday lives, because these were people we spent much daily, or at least every week we were with them. So then we started incorporating it into our lives. We started picking up the signs and the culture and the do's and the don'ts and we just saw it as another asset to our family because raising my own children how many times did I just you know give them a signal using ASL American Sign Language and see the positive communication you know we didn't have to be disruptive um, and they knew exactly what I meant so that form of communication we turned it into an asset into a plus then um, we've kept in touch with that family and it's just always been something that um, makes me aware of like I say it's another culture it's another language and and it and it's just something more exciting for us to learn and guess what there's no pronunciation <laughs> to kind of put it all together I've noticed that language teachers kind of do this a lot they or even classroom teachers there's certain things or mothers there's certain signals that we use to communicate things easier or without distraction or to just keep things flowing or as just a reminder sometimes you don't have to say something you know a mother can give a certain look a parent can do a certain thing and it, and and that's communication so when i was 
noticing that classroom teachers do this, mothers do this, parents do this, we communicate sometimes without using words. Well, I was incorporating that into my lessons with my vocabulary on my units. Then it kind of put two and two together and said, why am I creating these movements and gestures and signals if they already exist? And that's where the light bulb went on. And I just said, well, thanks to the internet, um, I might just be two steps ahead of my students, but I can incorporate real, true American Sign Language. And what they love about it is the fact that they come in here and it's a break from their daily routine. Uh, my students come in here every day with me for 30 minutes and I have all my classes every day back to back and as you can see there's no desks, there's no tables, there's no chairs. Um, it's physically, uh, I'm challenging them physically. They constantly, when they come in, they know they have to be on, their game is on. They have to be listening and speaking and using their body and communicating with me. And it's checks and balances also. The, the ASL allows me to see who's actually not just sitting there, but tuned out. Um, but they're actually taking the time to go through the mo motions together as a class and I can vis visibly tell who's still um, engaged and who isn't. Spanish with a little ASL on top turns out to be a pretty tasty dish that the kids can't get enough of. I, I've gotten great response from administrations and I um, not just from meeting with them and speaking after they've observed, but during my class when I see people totally engaged at every age and just enthralled, nobody is bored, no one's distracted, no one's doing any clock watching, everyone is like grinning from ear to ear. That's, to me, you can't, that's authentic. The other exciting thing was we've had guests from Mexico come on several occasions and I think, well, getting that same reaction, right? Because you would think they are native speakers. This is just going to bore them to tears. It's like watching paint dry. Um, it's numbers. It's colors. It's all the basics. But no, what made it refreshing and exciting for them was they'd never seen it presented like this. So guess what? They were just, they were all eyes and ears because my students were teaching them how to incorporate Spanish with the ASL, and it was just a win-win. I think Senora Cervantes can't get enough of it either. But what lies ahead? I, I think I kind of, I've been blessed. Something kind of fell into my lap. I, I kind of saw things working in different ways and brought them together, and I've just seen the magic. It's magic. It just, it's fun and it's exciting. And I mean, it's like everything I learned as a teacher about teaching and about learning and everything I know as uh, growing up in a bilingual home and then learning a foreign language in your 40s, you know, all those things combine and come together. And that's when I know that, that this, is, this is something with a lot of potential, huge potential. It's a lot of work, I won't lie to you, but is it worth it? Oh yeah, definitely for me. Now, I feel as you do, what you mentioned, I need to find a, a, a university or someone, maybe a linguistics department, I don't know, I need to research that. Or maybe there's already research in there. If it is, they're keeping it very quiet, they're keeping it a secret. But um, for them, you know, like to do some real science and studies on how this is working and what it's working. Because I can show you, um, the materials online with like how ASL, the, the, the benefits of ASL, uh, the retention and scores go up and all kinds of things. That Those facts are there. But who has studied how um, ASL in this environment for learning a foreign language and then specifically this, I would say the way I'm seeing Spanish because it has so much connection to English, you know, the cognitives and that and then throwing in the ASL, how those just combine so, so nicely. You know, it's not perfect, but it's just, it's been, it's been wonderful to witness. So as we wish you hasta la vista, we would also like to say thanks to Kyle Snage at the controls 
Dan's Weiss at the desk, and you for watching. This is Oxford Community Television, keeping it local.